Thanks for joining us. And in this webinar, I'm going to give you a short overview of the Trade Secrets Directive and give some thoughts on what businesses should be doing in light of it. Trade secrets are obviously important to businesses and you've got a chart in front of you which, according to an EUIPO report from July of this year, shows the relative importance of trade secrets and patents to various industries and businesses. I'm, I'm, I'm sceptical about how precise one can be, but, but you get the general idea. Despite their importance, though, at the moment, protection for trade secrets varies quite substantially between different EU countries. And this Trade Secrets Directive is designed to rectify this and ensure a consistent level of protection across Europe. The directive entered into force on the 5th of July 2016. Member states must incorporate it into domestic law by the 9th of June 2018, so next summer. But this isn't something that you only want to be starting to think about next summer. Rather, if you are bringing a claim next summer, you're going to want to be showing that you've always been protecting your confidential information and so that you've got something that you can enforce under the directive. So, moving on to the definition. Article 2.1 of the directive it explains what a trade secret is. And it's something which is secret, which has commercial value, and which has been subject to reasonable steps to keep it secret. And this definition is quite similar to the one from the TRIPS agreement, Article 39.2 if you're interested, which is itself similar to the definition under US Uniform Trade Secrets Act. So, so it's more of a, a narrower US TRIPS focus. English confidentiality law has got a, a broader definition. It doesn't require information to have commercial value, which has meant that under English law you can protect private information and there isn't that explicit requirement for there to be reasonable steps to keep information secret. It can be a, a factor, but it's not a headline requirement. The, the UK Parliament's European Scrutiny Committee has said that the UK's current protection of trade secrets is consistent with the, the terms of the proposed directive. Um, but the recitals say that this provides a homogenous definition of a trade secret, so I think there will be some changes, and I'm going to highlight some of these as we go through. Firstly, the directive sets out some examples of what lawful use is, and these include disassembly, use in accordance with honest commercial practices, which we'll come back to, and we've got uh, exceptions for the media, for employees to use their experience and, and skills honestly acquired. Unlawful use is if you require a trademark without authorization, that's unlawful. So is any conduct which is contrary to honest commercial practices. And this suggests that there may be some circumstances where even a you know ostensibly authorized use possibly could be unlawful if someone's behaving sufficiently badly. Um, what, what amounts to honest commercial practices is going to depend on the facts of each situation, but there has been some European guidance given in relation to trademarks where the European courts have said that it means a, a duty to act fairly, really. At a talk a few weeks ago in relation to um, some patents law, Lord Newberger, uh, who was recently president of the Supreme Court, said, said that fairness is a flexible concept and it's very difficult to apply in practice. And I think that's very much how the English judges have approached fairness as a, as a legal issue. But what this directive does is it brings in an element of, of unfair competition. And you can see that in the recitals and you can see it in the infringement elements here. It's more of a European approach. Not surprisingly, using and disclosing a trade secret is an unlawful act. I think more interestingly, the directive also says that goods which significantly benefit from confidential information are infringing goods. And if they're infringing goods, you can object to them being produced, offered, placed on the market, imported, exported, stored, which is all the sorts of things you can protect under patent law at the moment. Section 60 of the Patents Act. What I think is always going to depend on circumstances is whether or not it gets a significant benefit from a trade secret. And if you've got a, an improved processor, um, does that significantly improve a computer? Well, probably. If the processor is in a car, maybe not at the moment. But it's going to depend on the facts of each situation, I think. Another part that's been harmonised here is, is the test for relief. In terms of English law at the moment, for interim relief, 
a party seeking an injunction has to show that there's a serious question that needs to be tried and then you look really at the balance of convenience and, and whether or not either party will be adequately compensated. And this is quite helpful really because it means that you don't have a mini trial, you just say there is a reasonable argument that can go forward to trial and who's going to be harmed if an injunction isn't put in place. The test under the directive is slightly different. Firstly, courts have to satisfy themselves with a sufficient degree of certainty that um, a trade secret exists and it's been acquired unlawfully. And I don't think it's clear whether or not that really just mirrors the first part of the American cyanamide test, or if this is a slightly higher hurdle. Article 11.2 then explains the, if you, if you get over that first test, all the factors that have to be considered in order to determine whether or not to grant that interim relief. And it's not a balance of convenience test, although a lot of the factors are the same ones you would be considering for a balance of convenience. There is also not something which just says, if, if this is all terribly difficult, we maintain the status quo, which is, is where the English courts get to. So I think this is a similar test to the English test at the moment, but I don't think it's exactly the same. I think it could lead to different results. And as I'll come to later on, I think it's another reason to be thinking that you want to be able to, to demonstrate the value and specific features of a trade secret and the measures taken to protect the trade secret. And if you can do that early on, brilliant. There are similar requirements as well in relation to final injunctions. And very minor point, the English courts, if you've got a, an application for an interim injunction, the applicant will need to give cross undertakings to damages so that if they lose, they, they compensate the respondent and there's a provision for that here as well. One of the most important things that you need when you're suing to protect your confidential information is to ensure that you don't, in that process, destroy the confidentiality in the information, which has been a real problem throughout Europe. And Article 9 says that in response to a duly reasoned application or on their own initiative, courts can protect um, confidential information. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't necessarily protect information in other proceedings. So if you're suing for patent infringement or you're suing something entirely separate and you've got some trade secrets that you're you know, looking to um, disclose because they support your case or for some other reason, that trade secret may not be um, protected as a result of Article 9 because the directive said it, it doesn't affect disclosure in um, other judicial proceedings. English courts at the moment are pretty good at protecting confidential information. There was a decision handed down last year, Kerry Group and Bacavor, and if you go through it, you'll see there are large watches of it missing, which are all the technical descriptions of the, the trade secrets. And um, I can't say too much about it, but there's going to be a decision shortly from the English courts in relation to Onewire Planet and Huawei and the redactions to that public judgment. One thing that is always a factor with European disputes is where to sue. And the regulation doesn't include rules about where cases have to be brought. So I would expect some forum shopping. The English courts have traditionally been very good at protecting confidential information, but whether or not they'd be the right place to sue going forward might well depend on how Brexit proceeds. You've got in front of you some excerpts from the CPR which give you the times when a the court can give permission to serve on a defendant outside of the jurisdiction. So if you've got detriment um, suffered within England or you've got detriment resulting from acts committed within England, then um, you can get permission if you, if you apply for it that way. Moving on to the practical steps, what, what, what I think businesses will really want to be able to show is that they have taken reasonable steps to protect their confidential information. If the English courts come to consider that requirement for reasonable steps, then I think they will be looking at, at what US courts have done. And from that you can see that there isn't one simple answer, there's not a tick box exercise, but, but rather you're looking for a common sense and risk-based approach to find out what the, what, what the right way forward is. And, and firstly, I think businesses need to think about what information is actually a trade secret. 
when NDAs are drafted up, they they inevitably cover you know any discussion about football matches at the previous weekend and, and and anything discussed at a particular meeting. But it's it's quite helpful when looking to protect confidentiality to be thinking about what your your real key trade secrets are. What information has value to a business because it's not widely known? And sometimes this is licensing terms, sometimes it's formulas, sometimes it's algorithms, sometimes it's packaging designs, sometimes it's customer lists. And identifying some of that in broad terms can help um, focus minds you know, across the business and also of the employees that will be dealing with it on a day-to-day basis um, so they know what they need to be looking after. And once you've identified information, is it possible to segregate it um, physically and, and also electronically? Does your accounts team need to have access to your new packaging designs, to your scientists need access to, to your customer lists? And in doing this, you know, the easiest way to protect confidential information is obviously to limit the amount of people that know and have access to it. When, when you do have documents, um, although non-disclosure agreements will, will say that documents don't have to be marked as confidential, it's quite helpful where it's possible to do so to have a marking policy and to mark documents as confidential, um, to follow up conversations about confidential information in writing and say we, we had a meeting today and we discussed some confidential issues here. With this, you're also going to want to have um, a standard non-disclosure agreement which works across the business wherever possible. And with that, a policy can be fantastic to set out how people should identify confidential information and how and when to use non-disclosure agreements. The shorter they are, the more likely they are to be signed. And something within the agreement which also identifies what bits need to be protected. Lots of these issues, like deletion and data minimisation and taking appropriate technical and organisational measures, are things that businesses will be doing anyway in relation to GDPR, in relation to personal data. And so if you're thinking about it all in relation to that, particularly also all of the um, the, the IT infrastructure and the, the technical bits there, th- this could be a helpful time to be making sure that your confidential information is also protected. And once you've identified where all of the confidential information is, think about what the risks are. Is it employees? Is it the supply chain? Is it external threats? There's a statistic which may or may not be true, uh, which is that sort of two thirds of breaches of trade secrets come from people known to the business, whether that's suppliers or staff. And if, if it's really key and you've got staff, th- then although confidentiality terms are quite usual in contracts, um, is it worth putting in training about confidentiality? Is it worth putting in a, a policy setting out how staff need to identify and protect confidential information? Obviously also um, you need to ensure that leavers are rev- reminded not to use confidential information and to, to delete and return everything. With the supply chain, contracts are usual, but do you need to see your suppliers' policies? Do they have proper IT security? Do you need to be, uh, do you need to have the power to audit them, and do you need to be auditing them? And with external threats, uh, I mean, I think more and more we're seeing the risk of, you, we, we're seeing a cyber risk here. When you're doing all of these things, or whatever of these things are appropriate, you would make life easier for yourself if you record and document all of this, so that if you do have to fight an injunction or, or go to court quickly, you can neatly explain how you've taken all of these sensible measures. So I think in terms of a summary, it comes into force next June. It, it's easier to protect confidential information across Europe, and some issues will need to be worked out through the courts. In terms of a practical step, think about confidentiality and, and, and review your policies. Okay, fantastic. So I think we need to wrap up.